Well, uh, Shabbat Shalom and welcome everyone to the Bible classes of the Holy Scriptures in Israel. We want to welcome you today for the meeting. Today we are going to uh, continue and hopefully we'll conclude with the book of Esther. And we have arrived to the ninth chapter, to the last portion of the ninth chapter of the book of Esther. And then we will read also the first uh, I mean, the, really the next verses of uh, chapter 10, which is uh, a few verses. And with the help of the Lord, we will conclude with the study of the book of Esther. <clears throat> so please, uh, let's pray together. Hopefully you have a Bible with you, my dear friend. Open your Bible to Esther chapter uh, 9. So our God and our Father, thank you for the privilege of being under the sound of your word. Bless your word as we study it together, for we ask it in Yeshua, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, beloved friend, please open your Bible to uh, Esther chapter 9, and we are reading from verse 20 into chapter 10 and verse 3, and I'm reading <clears throat> Esther 9 and verse 20. And Mordechai wrote these things and sent letters unto all the Jews that were in all the provinces of the king Achashverosh, both nigh and far, to establish this among them, that they should keep the fourteenth day of the month of Adar and the fifteenth day of the same yearly as the days wherein the Jews rested from their enemies, and the month which was turned unto them from sorrow to joy, and from mourning unto good day, that they should make them days of uh, feasting and joy, and of sending portions one to another, and gifts to the poor. And the Jews undertook to do as they had begun, and as Mordechai had written unto them, because Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagai, the enemy of all the Jews, had devised against the Jews to destroy them, and had cast pool, that is, the lot, to consume them and to destroy them. But when Esther came before the king, he uh, commanded by letters that this wicked device, which he devised against the Jews, should return upon his own head, and that he and his sons should be hung on a gallows. Wherefore they called these days Purim, after the name of Pur. Therefore, all the words of this letter and of that which they had seen concerning this matter and which had come unto them. <clears throat> the Jews ordained and took upon them and upon their seed and upon all such as joined themselves unto them so, that, so as it should not fail that they would keep these two days according to the writing and according to their appointed time every year, and that these days should be remembered and kept throughout every generation, every family, every province, and every city, and that these days of Purim should not fail from among the Jews, nor the memorial of them perish from their seed. Then Esther the queen, the daughter of Avichail, and Mordechai the Jew wrote with all authority to confirm this second letter of Purim. And he sent the letters unto all the Jews to the 127 provinces of the kingdom of Achashverosh with words of shalom, peace, 
and truth, emet. Then we read in verse uh, 31, to confirm these days of Purim in their times appointed according as Mordechai the Jew and Esther the queen had had enjoined them and as they had decreed for themselves and for their seed. The matters of the fa- of the feasting, uh, um, uh, the fasting, and their cry, and the decree of Esther confirmed these matters of Purim, and was written in the book. And now let's go to chapter ten, verses one, two, and three. And the king Achashverosh laid a tribute upon the land and upon the isles of the sea. And all the act of his power and of his might, and the declaration of the greatness of Mordechai, whereunto the king advanced him, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Media and Persia? For Mordechai the Jew was next unto King Hashverosh, and great among the Jews, and accepted of the multitude of his brethren, seeking the wealth of his people, and speaking, again, shalom, peace, to all his seed. And I will stop here with the reading, beloved brothers and sisters. Well, this portion is the final portion that we have in our study together of the book of Esther. I find it such a, an encouraging a, 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 a word that is, is found in the canon of the, of, the, of the Hebrew scriptures, which God has chosen to place in the canon of his word, in the Tanakh, in the Hebrew scriptures. And the lesson, of course, beloved brothers and sisters, that we learn from the book of Esther is the lessons of the sovereignty of God and the providence of God. God is not only sovereign, he is what we call in Hebrew shalit. He is a ruler. He is ruling all all over the nations of the world, watching over his own people. But God is also in his providence, working all things to come about to fulfill his very own will, whether it is for Israel, the nation, or whether it is for the assembly of the living God. Well, we have arrived now to this portion in the book of Esther, which is really the final statements uh, that we learn here. We really have the introduction of the Feast of Purim, Chag Purim, we call it in Hebrew, and the greatness of Mordechai. The institution of the Feast of Purim, this is at the end of chapter 9, verses 20 to 32, and the greatness of Mordechai is presented in chapter 10, and verses 1, 2, and 3. Now, let me just mention, beloved brothers and sisters, that when we have arrived to chapter 9, the final, really the final portion of the book of Esther, we have learned of the victory of the Jewish people over their enemies who came and sought to kill them. To remind you, according to the first 10 verses of this chapter, uh, chapter uh, 9, we have already learned that in chapter 9 there was a triumph (coughs) of the Jewish people over their enemies who sought to destroy them. To remind you that Haman... Haman, this wicked man, he was from the uh, from the tribe that is called the Amalekites. The Amalekites, Amalek, was the the tribe or a nation that came against God's people of Israel, who just came out of the land of Egypt. The redeemed people of Israel, the first enemy, that the redeemed people of Israel who came after Passover, after Pesach, out of the land of Mitzrayim, Egypt, they were attacked by Amalek. And Amalek have been the nation and the tribe and the people that from generation to generation fought against our people, the people of Israel. 
God said to the uh, to Moses uh, and to the nation of Israel that he will have from generation to generation he will fight against the the people of Amalek. And eventually he promised in the book of Deuteronomy that the, the Amalekites, Amalek, will be destroyed from the face of this earth. Now, if you remember, beloved brothers and sisters, we mentioned that Amalek is a picture of the old nature that you and I possess. And because of our sin, all nature that we possess, we know that the, we discover after we became believers in the Lord Yeshua, Jesus, the Messiah, that our first enemy that attack us and is seeking to hinder us from walking with the Lord, walking with God, following the Lord Yeshua, Jesus, the Messiah, is our old sinful nature. The flesh Yeshua said, prophet is nothing. The apostle Shaul Paul said in Romans, I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. And the closest enemy of God's people is none else but the flesh, the sin nature that we all possess. Well, what we have learned here in chapter 9 that the Jewish people were victorious by divine design over a, a, the enemies who sought to destroy them. And if you remember that uh, Haman set a date on the 13th day of the month of Adar to destroy all Jews, all the Jewish people, entire destruction of the Jewish people. To remind you that we have already read that all the Jews were called to be destroyed as Haman have set this in order. And if you remember, beloved brothers and sisters, the, uh, the second verdict that was sent once Haman was hung on the gallow that he prepared for Mordechai, then the king had to send a second verdict, a second letter. And we learn from that that the second letter represents uh, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, in the Messiah, Yeshua, which lead us to life. And so the first, the first verdict was to kill all the Jewish people in one day on the 13th day of the month of Adar. But then the second verdict was that the Jewish people can protect themselves and indeed they have protected themselves from all their enemies who came against them. We have learned that in Esther chapter 9, verses 1 to 19. In verses 1 to 10, there was a victory of the Jewish people over the, their enemies. And in verses 11 to 19, the king is questioning Esther request and ask her, ask him to hang on the to hang also the ten sons of Haman. And you and I might say, well, what is it? Why don't they have mercy? Why they do that? And we learn, beloved brothers and sisters, that the Haman and his descendants are representing this old sinful nature, the enemies of God's people, whether it is the enemies of Israel or the enemies of the assembly. And by destroying them, it's representing the fact that God will one day will do away with uh, sin and will ultimately he God through the person of the Lord Jesus will reign and rule over this world and bring about a, not only a messianic kingdom but an eternal order where flesh will be no more and God will be all in all and so now as we arrive to the final verses here in Esther chapter 9 from verse 20 to verse 32, we find now the establishment of a feast called Purim. In Hebrew, it's called Chag Purim. It's one of the most loved feasts in the history of our people, the Jewish people. Every Jewish boy and girl know very well the importance of the feast of Purim, the feast of uh, Esther. Notice that, first of all, we learn in verse 20, 21, and 22 that Mordechai is sending letters 
requesting from all the Jewish community to establish and to the keeping of these two days of the 14th and the 15th of the month of Adar. Notice that, let me read you these verses. We read in verse 20, Esther 9, and verse 20, And Mordechai wrote these things, and he sent letters to all the Jews that were in all the provinces of the king Ahasuerus, both nigh and far, to, to establish, listen to this, to establish among them that they should keep the 14th day of the month of Adar and the 15th day of that same yearly. Now notice what happened here. There is now an establishing of a feast. In Hebrew, we call it Chag or Moed. Moed means appointed season. Chag means a celebration in Hebrew. To establish a Chag, a feast, on these two days that are called here the 14th and the 15th day of the month of Adar, and to do so yearly. Now, brothers and sisters, let me just mention something. The Feast of Purim that we are going to read about now is not part of the seven feasts of Yehovah, of the Lord, mentioned in Leviticus chapter 23. The seven feasts of the Lord in Leviticus chapter 23 present before us the program of God and the first coming and the second coming of the Messiah. The Messiah came to this world as a lamb. He became the Passover lamb. The Messiah was sinless, the unleavened bread. The Messiah died and was buried and rose again, the feast of uh, first fruit. The Messiah, Jesus, sent the Holy Spirit of God to establish what is known the new covenant, bringing about together both Jews and Gentiles, is seen in the Feast of Shavuot, the Feast of Pentecost. All these four Moadim, four feasts of the Lord, have been already accomplished historically at the first coming of the Messiah and the sending of the Holy Spirit to form the body of Christ, the body of Messiah, in Acts chapter 2. The remaining fall feast of the Lord speak about the second coming of the Messiah. The Feast of Trumpets speak about the future day when the people of Israel will be regathered back to the land, the physical regathering of the people of Israel, the Jewish people, back to the land. The Day of Atonement represents the, 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 the blood of the Atonement when the Jewish people will repent before the Lord, recognizing that He is the Messiah and ultimately will turn back to him. This is the regeneration of the nation of Israel. And the Feast of Tabernacle, in Hebrew we call it Sukkot, represent the Messianic kingdom, where Israel restored back to the land, and the Messiah Jesus that was rejected one time and now accepted, he will rule and reign over Israel and all the nations of the world. We live, beloved brothers and sisters, between the first coming of the Messiah and the second coming of the Messiah during these present days of the church age. There was about uh, the fourth month, the fifth month, and the sixth month between these two, uh, two periods of time in the history of Israel. We live during the church age, during the time where the assembly, Jews and Gentiles, are united together in the body of Christ, the body of Messiah, forming what is known to be the ecclesia, the called out one, the assembly, uh, the bride of Christ. Now, but now we have an institution of another feast that is not part of the seven feasts of the Lord. And that feast is celebrated and instituted by Mordechai and by Esther to all the Jewish community in the 127 provinces. And it is called here, notice that as we are leading in verse 20, 21, and 22, Mordechai is sending these letters to all the Jewish people of all the provinces of the 127. And what he is, notice he says, to establish. The word for establish comes from the Hebrew word lekayem. Lekayem means to not only uh, uh, um, to establish, but to, to fulfill it, 
to act upon it, to live it out, to perform that. And what is to do, what is to perform, what is to establish? Notice, to keep the 14th day of the month of Adar and the 15th day every year, beloved brothers and sisters. And notice that it says in verse 22 of Esther chapter 9, as the days wherein the Jews, notice, they rested from all their enemies, and the month which was turned unto them from sorrow to joy, and from mourning into a good day, that they should make them days of, notice, feasting and joy, and the sending of portion one to another, and gifts to the poor. Now notice that, beloved brothers and sisters. Notice what we read here. It is very interesting how God is a sovereign God who his providence, providence means that he's caring for his own people and his own affairs here in this world. He's overseeing all what is going on here in this world. And he preserved a nation that was going to be destroyed by the Agagite, by the Amalekite, by, by, by Haman and those that follow him to destroy the people, the Jewish people, throughout the whole 127 provinces of King Ahasuerus, both young and old and a male and female, all the Jewish people were called to be destroyed on the 13th day of the month of Adar. But by divine design, here in the book of Esther, although the name of the Lord is not mentioned, although the word prayer is not mentioned, yet God, who is caring over his own people, watching over his people, he preserved his own people, the people of Israel, and he protected them because he is intending to bring them, to turn their sorrow into joy, and to turn from days, such we read, from mourning into a good day. The day should not only... A, fa a feast and, and have joy, but they should also send portion one to another, send gifts to the poor, and be a blessing to all those that are around it. That is a representation, beloved brothers and sisters, of what will take place according to the book of Romans chapter 11, when God is going to restore his people and to be a blessing to the world in which we live here today. Where we read in Romans chapter 11, and where we read, if the fall of them of, uh, uh, was the richest to the world, and the diminishing of them was the richest to the Gentile, how much more their fullness be? Romans 11 and verse 12. Paul said it to the local church in the city of Rome. So notice that. If you now go with me for a moment back, uh, uh, I go to the book of Psalm for a moment. I want to read to you a verse in Psalm uh, chapter 30. And there we read in verses uh, uh, 10 and 11. Listen to what the psalmist said when the Lord is turning the table around. Notice what we read in uh, Psalm 30 verse 10. Hear, O Lord, and have mercy upon me. Lord, be thou my helper. Thou hast turned from me my mourning into dancing. Thou hast put off my sackcloth and girded me with gladness. The psalmist of Israel uh, those, uh, the, the song that was sang in the dedication of the house of David, they were singing, Lord, you have turned from me my mourning into dancing, and my sackcloth you have turned it into gladness. Amazing to see how the tables are turning around when God is watching over his own people. You can turn with me for one more verse, beloved brothers and sisters, to the prophet Isaiah in chapter 61, where we read, <clears throat> listen to what we read 
in Isaiah chapter 61 and verses 1, 2, and 3. Looking forward to these days of full restoration, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Because the Lord has anointed me, this is the Messiah Jesus is speaking before his incarnation. The Lord has anointed me to preach the good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind out the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captive, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Listen to this. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Notice, and the day of vengeance of our God, and notice to comfort uh, them all that are in mourning. And then verse 3, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty uh, for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. That's what will happen when God ultimately will bring to fruition that which he is intending uh, to bring about in the history of the people of Israel. Blessing to the world is also will come. But here, right in the diaspora and the dispersion, God protected the people of Israel, the Jewish people, and there is a set up of a, an institution of a feast that is called the Feast of Purim. When it will be celebrated? Well, on the 14th and the 15th of the month of Adal, because there was a turning from mourning into a good day, from sorrow unto joy. And so now that he sent these letters, Esther 9, verse 20, 21, and 22, then in verse 23 to verse 28, there is a commitment of the Jewish community and the meaning of the Feast of Purim. Look at the commitment. There is a commitment. Although these, the feast, the seven feasts of the Lord were established long time ago, instituted by God under the law in the Torah, but now there is event that took place, the protection of the Lord over the Jewish people in the diaspora and the dispersion. Now the commitment that the Jewish people have made. In verse 23 to verse 28, we read, listen to this. First of all, <clears throat> verse 23 and 24, the Jews undertook to keep these days because of all what Haman planned to do against them. So we read, and the Jews overtook, notice that, or undertook, to do as they had begun. And as Mordechai had written unto them, because Haman, notice that, they always look back at what Haman planned to do. Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagai, the enemy of the Jews, of all the Jews, had a device against the Jews to destroy them. And he cast poor, that is, the lot to consume them and to destroy them. Notice that the <coughs> feast of Esther or the feast of Purim, <coughs> called here Purim, is given or was established because of the casting of a lot. You see, Haman, according to the early chapters, he cast lots from day to day, from month to month, and until the time would come where this will be the Lord, it will be the day where he will destroy Mordechai's people. If you just go back for a moment to chapter 3 of Esther, and you notice what we read in verse 7. And notice that in the first month, that is the month of Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, they cast poor, that is the lot, before Haman from day to day and from month to month to the twelfth month, that is the month of Adal. And notice we do read that eventually 
they have chosen, according to chapter 4 as well, they have chosen the 13th day of the month of Adar to, call, to kill all the Jewish people. Now you can see, beloved brothers and sisters, <coughs> that although <coughs> a day was set, but God in a supernatural way preserved the people of Israel and Haman's plan was frustrated. And instead of killing Mordechai and killing the Jewish people, he ended up to be hung on a gallow. His ten sons end up to be hung on the gallow. The Jewish people have destroyed those that came against them to kill them. And God preserved the people of Israel. So now what we read in these verses 23 and 24, they undertook to fulfill the requirement of Mordechai. And we also have the meaning of the uh, the Feast of Purim. Uh, why do they do that? Because, not as he cast out poor, that is the lot, to consume them and to destroy them. Imagine what it meant for them to anticipate the day, the 13th day of the month of Adar, to be destroyed in one day. But by the mercy and the grace of God, by the providence of God, the tables which were changed will turn over. And so we find out, beloved brothers and sisters, in the next verses, verses 25 and 26, the calling of these events, the naming of the feast that is celebrated by the Jewish people from that day, from uh, this 500 BC. And uh, in those days, all the way till today, this feast is still being celebrated by the Jewish people worldwide. Let me read you these verses, 25 and 26. But when, notice we read, But when Esther came before the king and commanded by letter that, he, that his wicked device, uh, which he devised against the Jews, should return upon his own head, and that he had and his sons should be hung on a gallows, then verse 26, wherefore they called, listen, they named this feast, these days, those two days, 14th and 15th of the month of uh, Adar, they named these days Purim. Pur is singular, Purim is plural. They come from the English word lots, to cast a lot, to cast a lot, and when the lot is being cast, uh, the answer, God is the one that is the one who is ultimately bring the outcome. You remember what we read uh, in, uh, in the book of uh, 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 Proverbs. If you turn with me uh, to the book of Proverbs, listen what we read there in verse 33 of Proverbs chapter 16. The lot is cast into the lap but the whole disposing thereof is of the Lord, is of Jehovah. Lots are being cast by men. Lots are being cast by others. But ultimately, the disposing thereof, the outcome of, all, of, of it is of the Lord. He is sovereign. And his providence is ruling over all this world. His will will be accomplished. And so, as uh, beloved brothers and sisters, we can see as we look at what's happening here in the, uh, in the arrangement of God over all the, the affairs that took place in the in the whole history of the Jewish people, God is sovereign. His providence is over all, according to Daniel 4.35 and Ephesians 1 and verse 11. God arranged everything, including the deliverance of his people Israel from the hands of Haman and those that sought to destroy them. Listen to this. God arranged for Queen Vashti to lose her position. God arranged for the plan for the replacement of Vashti. God arranged for Esther to be brought to the Persian palace. God arranged for Esther to have a favor before King Hashverosh. God arranged for Mordechai to watch over Esther in the palace. 
God arranged for the, the casting of the law to be postponed to 11 months later, according to chapter 3 of Esther, verses 12 and 13. God arranged for Haman to delay the killing of Mordechai. God arranged for Esther to delay her request for the second banquet. God arranged for Haman's anger to come to rise uh, on a particular day. And God arranged for King Ahasuerus to have a sleepless night. God arranged for King Ahasuerus to read in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Persia in that sleepless night. God arranged for King Ahasuerus to listen about Mordechai and to help him. And God arranged the preservation of his people, the Jewish people. God is sovereign. His providence is over all. He is the one that ruleth over the affairs of mankind here in this world, beloved brothers and sisters. Notice what we read in Daniel uh, chapter 4 and verse uh, uh, 35, beloved brothers and sisters. And I'll read you this verse, Daniel chapter 4 and verse 35. We do read, listen to this, we read in verse 35, And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? God is arranging all things to go after the counsel of his own will, beloved a brother's and sisters, and that's why it's important to see the sovereignty of God and the providence of God in the book of Esther. In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 11, we read, In whom also we have obtained inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. God is sovereign. And God is working all things after his own will. And so we are back as we are continuing here, beloved brothers and sisters, <coughs> in our study of the book of Esther. And so notice that we continue to read now. Notice that verses um, uh, 27 and verses 28. Listen to this of uh, Esther chapter uh, 9, verse 27 and 28. We do read of the or a ordering of Purim to be kept by all the Jewish people from generation to generation, from family to family, from, uh, from city to city. And notice what we read in verses 27 and verse 28. The Jews ordained and took upon them and upon their seed and upon all such as anointed themselves uh, as join themselves unto them, so as it should not fail, that they would keep these two days according to their writing and according to their appointed time. Notice, every year, beloved brothers and sisters, every year they took upon themselves, they ordained it, they took it upon them, not only for themselves, but their seed, Zera. Hayehudim, the seed of the Jewish people. In verse 28, we read, And that these days should be remembered and kept throughout every generation, every family, every province, and every city. And all, notice that, all these, these days of Purim should not fail from among them, among the Jewish people, nor the memorial of them perish from their seed. It is very interesting because whenever you read in the English here, every generation, every family, every province, every city, it, the word for every is really the repetition of the same Hebrew word. In Hebrew, we say 
דור ודור. משפחה ומשפחה, the same word repeated. מדינה ומדינה. עיר ועיר. Instead of saying every generation, we say generation, generation. Every family, we say family and family. Every province, we say מדינה ומדינה. And every city, עיר ועיר, city and city, province and province, family and family, generation and generation, and the seed of the Jewish people will continue to keep that feast. Now again, it's not one of the seven feasts of the Lord found in Leviticus chapter 23, but it is part of the canon of the word of God established by the Jewish people during the time when they were protected by God supernaturally. from their enemies, and the Feast of Purim, the Feast of Lots, the Feast of Esther was established to be kept on the 14th and the 15th of the month of Adar. Well, now in verses 29 to 32, as we are going to the conclusion of the ninth chapter, we see the second letters and confirmation was sent to by Esther. Notice that we read, and I'm reading that verse 29 and onward. And Esther the queen, the daughter of Avichail, and Mordechai the Jew, they wrote with all authority to confirm the second letter of Purim. And he sent the letters unto all the Jews, to the 127 provinces of the kingdom of Ahasuerus. And we read that with words of shalom and truth. Very interesting. You find here these two words, peace and truth. Shalom ve'emet. Shalom ve'emet. A peace and truth. Peace comes on the basis of truth. And whenever there is truth presented, then there will be true shalom, true peace. And therefore, We have here that uh, when truth is presented, and therefore they can have this peace, words of peace and words of truth. And so, and uh, to confirm these days of Purim, verse 31, notice that, to confirm the days of Purim, in their time appointed, according as Mordechai the Jew and Esther the queen had enjoined them, And as they had decreed for themselves and for their seed, the method of, notice that, fasting and their cry. Now notice that, they are reminded themselves also that they will need, notice that the fasting, when they, when they were fasting and they were crying to God, as we have read earlier in chapter 4, when Haman have set the day to, to destroy the Jewish people. Esther, if you remember, she came and she asked Mordechai that he and all the Jewish people will fast for her. Remember Mordechai had this uh, um, um, ashes upon himself and cloth and ashes and he was fasting. So if you go back for a moment to chapter 4, you notice that, beloved brothers and sisters, Notice that Esther's maid, verse 4 of chapter 4, Esther's, I'll read actually verse 3 as well. And every and in every province, province whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, there was a great mourning among the Jews, and fasting, and weeping, and wailing, and many laying sackcloth and ashes. So Esther made and, and her chamberlain came and told it her. Then was the queen exceedingly grieved, and she went and she sent raiment for, to clothe Mordechai and to take away his sackcloth. Now, after Mordechai told her what happening, what have happened there, beloved brothers and sisters, look what we read in verse 16 of the same fourth chapter. Esther now said to Mordechai in verse 16, Go and gather all the Jews that are present in Shushan and fast ye for me, she asked him. 
and neither eat nor drink for three days, night nor days. I also and my maidens will fast likewise. So I will go unto the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. Notice there was fasting and mourning. There were sorrows in anticipation of being destroyed in one day. So even at the end of the book of Esther, at the end when the conclusion coming, the Jewish people are reminded of the fact that they once fasted and they mourn and they cried. They cried to God, although the name of God is not mentioned, uh, beloved brothers and sisters, in this portion of the word of God. And that tells us that uh, it is so important never to forget the grace of God that uh, once we have, uh, once the soul turn into joy, one can never forget the grace of God and the provision of God in a day of a soul. And that's why even today, beloved brothers and sisters, before the Feast of Purim began, there is a custom by the Jewish people to begin the Feast of Esther by fasting. And one of the customs in the Feast of Purim is, first of all, to listen to the public reading of the whole book of Esther. It is called Megillat Esther, the scroll of Esther. It is customary up till today in the synagogue, in Beit Knesset, and wherever the Jewish community are in families to, uh, to read the whole book of Esther and to rec uh, recollect uh, the events that took place and the, the, the sovereignty of God and the providence of God watching over his own people. But also, before the 13th day of the month of Adar, which is the month where uh, the, the day of the month where the Jews were supposed to be killed by Haman and those that would do so, there is the custom as well to fast. To be reminded of those days and those people of old, the family, the people, the Jewish community of days of, of old, how they were uh, anticipating the, their destruction. And they fasted and they prayed to God, although they were not in the land. But they knew very well the living God of their fathers. And they fasted and they, uh, and they prayed and, they, and the Lord delivered them. There is a various custom that are still going on today. We will see it right now. The custom is according to chapter 9, which we read, verses 17, 18, and 18, and 19 is to give portion to one another, gifts and so on, to be reminded of the grace and the mercy of God who provided for them the ability to be sustained. Also, if you remember, we did read that there was a giving a, a gift to the poor, the, in Hebrew, the Evionim, in verse 22. And then the celebration, celebrating the feast of Purim with gladness and because of God's supernatural help. This is a feast of celebration. There's a joy that is uh, uh, presented because why God have turned the, 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 for the Jewish people from sorrow to joy and from mourning to a good day. During the Feast of Esther, there is also a custom uh, to, um, a, a, the custom is to actually to, uh, a, a, to dress with various costumes. Some dress with the costume of uh, of uh, Mordechai, the boys, the girls, uh, the girls uh, dressed with a, with a costume of, of Esther, Queen Esther. And some even dare to wear the costume of Haman. And every time Haman's name is mentioned in the synagogue, there is a, a certain noise that is being made because of he was the one that was the enemy of the Jewish people. 
And of course, one of the final customs that the Jewish people have during the Feast of Purim is to eat special cookies that are called, still today, Oznei Haman, Haman's ears. Whatever the reason that they gave that name, I don't know, but it is amazing to remind them that how things that were bitter turn into sweet and sorrow turn to joy. And so these are custom, but to listen to the public reading of the book of Esther and to fasting before the feasting began. Looking back to the days of uh, mourning, which turn into joy. So as we are reading in conclusion here of chapter uh, 9 of the book of Esther, verses 29 and 30, Esther and Mordechai send these second letters. Then in verse 31 and 32, the Jewish community kept the feast of Purim. And I'm reading these verse 31 and 32. And to confirm these days of Purim in, in their time appointed, according as Mordechai the Jew and Esther the queen have joined them, and as they enjoined them, and as they had decreed for themselves and for their seeds, the matters of the a fasting and their cry. And the decree of Esther confirmed these matters of Purim and it was written in the book. And here's the book that we are reading today, beloved brothers and sisters, the book of Esther, that it is given to us by divine inspiration. The God of providence Though his name is not mentioned, he's watching over his own people. And he's watching over you and I today. If you and I belong to the assembly of the living God, he is watching over his own people today, beloved brothers and sisters, you and I who belong to him today. And so now let's conclude. Let's conclude with the book of Esther in chapter 10. We have a very short chapter, only three verses. And in these three verses, we are presented with the fame and the greatness of Mordechai. And to remind you that Mordechai became a type and a picture of our Lord Jesus the Messiah, who God delight to honor. God delight that all men will bow before him, every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ, that Yeshua HaMashiach is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And Mordechai is being here elevated and placed in a higher position, second to King Ahasuerus, just like his brethren in days of old, such as Daniel, such as Yosef such as Moses, such as others in days of old whom God have raised him to be a, a, a blessing to the world in days of old, and such as the Messiah Jesus that today is rejected and despised. He will be the one beloved friend, beloved brothers and sisters, that God will exalt and extol and place him at the pinnacle of the universe. He's already sitting at God's right hand. We read that the Lord said unto my Lord, David said, that Jehovah said to his Lord, his Messiah, his master, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. And one day the rejected Messiah Yeshua will come and rule and reign over this world and over his people Israel at his second coming. And so we read chapter 10, verses 1, 2, and 3. And King Ahasuerus, he laid a tribute upon the land and upon the isles of the sea. Secondly, we read in verse 2, and all the acts of his power and of his might and the declaration of the greatness of Mordechai, whereunto the king advanced him and they not are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of the Medes and the Persian? Notice then, again, brothers and sisters, you see, you see the hand of God. This man, the Jewish man, Mordechai, who was supposed to be killed by Haman, 
he now had been de declared great by the king who advanced him. The king who signed and his ring was sealing the letter that was supposed to destroy Mordechai and Mordechai's people. The very same king is now advanced Mordechai. And his greatness of Mordechai was known by all. It says it is written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of the Medes and the Persian. So we read in the last verses, in verse 3, Mordechai the Jew was a blessing, notice, to his brethren, to his people, to his seed, and really to all the world. All the 127 provinces of the Medo and the Persian. We read in verse 3 of uh, Esther chapter 10, from notice for Mordechai the Jew, was next unto King Ahasuerus, and great before, notice of great before, great among the Jews, and accepted of the multitude of his brethren, seeking the wealth of his people, and speaking peace, shalom, to all his seed. Now, beloved brothers and sisters, doesn't that remind us of the days of Yosef, of Joseph, whom his brethren rejected him at his, at the, at the, at the, at the at earlier at his days, his, at his youth, and rejected him and sold him to the Midianite, and ultimately they took him to the land of Egypt. And then, when his brethren were sent again later on to the land of Egypt, he revealed himself to them. And ultimately his brethren, beloved brothers and sisters, recognized Yosef. And Yosef blessed them. And Yosef was a, a blessing to his father, Yaakov, and all his own brethren. Here we see Mordechai now. Mordechai, he says he's next to King Ahasuerus. He is great among the, all the Jews. He is accepted of the multitude of his brethren. You know, accepted. I always think about that. The one who was rejected and who still is rejected by his own people, Yeshua the Messiah, Jesus the Messiah, will one day be accepted by the nation. And Israel will recognize the one whom they have rejected for so many years. Here, this word accepted by his brethren and seeking the, the wealth of his people and speaking peace, shalom, unto all his seed. That takes us, beloved brothers and sisters, to the future day, just like the Lord Jesus the Messiah was once rejected and still rejected one day. Beloved brothers and sisters, he will be accepted by the nation of Israel. A beloved brothers and sisters. So just to conclude, what do we learn here from this book of Esther? We learn from the book of Esther of the sovereignty of God and the providence of God. Also in relation to the church, to the assembly. That you and I, beloved brothers and sisters, who live today during the church age, you and I belong to the Lord and He will take care over His own people. And whatsoever things were written aforetime, they were written for our learning, that we through patience and the comfort of Scripture might have hope. Just like God dealt with His earthly people Israel, in days of old, and still sustaining them, preserving them for the future day, you and I who belong to the Lord Jesus, the Messiah, to the assembly of the living God, God is watching over his own. The gates of Hades shall not prevail against the assembly. God will ultimately take his own people. The Lord Jesus will come and take his own heavenly company to be with him for time and for eternity. 
and whatsoever things have happened to them, it is applying to us, lesson for us to learn from the events that took place in the history of the Jewish people that are recorded for us here in the book of Esther. For we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. God has a purpose for you and for me. And may the Lord encourage us to continue on to follow after him. He's a good God. He's a gracious God. He's a sovereign God. He's a God of providence. Well, may the Lord bless you, my dear friend. We concluded now with the book of Esther. And uh, we thank the Lord for giving us the grace to be able to study together such a wonderful uh, record of Jewish history that is found in the Word of God. So our God and our Father, bless your word, we pray. Uh, teach us the lesson that we need to learn and help us to continue to follow after you. We ask it in the name of Yeshua. Jesus, our Lord and our Messiah. Amen and amen. My dear friend, God bless you. Until the next time, we say Shabbat Shalom. Shalom, shalom. Bye-bye.